Hello, Hellions and Hubble Goblins. My name is TBS Guy, and um, it occurred to me that probably the reason why Nocturne, Vigar, and Vladimir got lore updates recently is because because it's Halloween and they're spooky. So that it, I think. Probably that was why they did it that way. I mean, it certainly makes sense, at least. And I think the reason why it didn't occur to me earlier is because I don't celebrate Halloween. We don't we don't really do that where I live, so it's not really been on my mind. But it just, it just kind of occurred to me that, oh, right, the vampire and the tiny evil overlord and the dream demon. Yeah, you know what? Maybe there is a commonality between them. Anyway, we have already had a What's the Deal with Vladimir video where we talked about, you know, the upgrades to his biography and sort of the rather terrible state of his character design and where he is now as a character. But one of the big parts of the lore update that Vladimir has received is this um, new short story called Art is Life by Graham McNeil. And it was a short story that... Um, I felt like this served its own video. So, if you're unfamiliar, videos like these, where I do a full deep dive into a short story, essentially we're gonna be reading through the whole damn thing, all of it, and I'm gonna be commenting on it as I go, and then usually what happens is that the longer I go, the more it just turns into a straight up reading of the story because I'm gonna have <clears throat> covered most of the topics that I'll want to talk about along the way. And you can think of it sort of as a live editing session. And, uh, just to set expectations here, when I point out stuff that, oh, this is not, I will change that, or I don't like this part, or that part doesn't really make sense, that's not me saying, oh, I'm smarter and better than the writer who made this. I know they made mistakes, and I know how to fix them. That's not really what it is. What it is here is me behaving as an editor, making suggestions, saying, okay, this thing could be cleaned up, this thing could be changed, you could think about doing that a different way, and providing a different perspective. And kind of the point of it is that if you're a writer yourself, or if you enjoy writing, or just if you enjoy reading, it's an opportunity to see another perspective on a story and sort of use that as a jumping off point to think about how, how you would critically think about your own stories or other stories that you're reading. That's the point of this. It's not really so much a thing of, ah, here's a mistake, here's a mistake, and then crossing them out with red ink and then writing D- minus and see me after class up in the corner. That's not really how, it's, how it goes down with these things. So, with all of that out of the way, strap yourselves in for a long one. Art is a Life by Graham McNeil. Knights in Noxes were never silent. You couldn't cram so many thousands of people from all across the Empire into one place and expect quiet. Desert marching songs from the Sagaya Enclave drifted from their tented pavilions by the water, and the martial clashings of blades, or oh, the martial clashing of blades echoed from a nearby Reckoner's arena. Drake hounds corralled in an iron-walled enclosure howled as they caught the scent of slaughtered livestock from the northern kill yards. And so here, I'm gonna do uh, one of my um, all-time classic nit nitpicks, like one of the ones I pretty much always uh, talk about when I deal with stories like this, and that's the danger of overloading on universe-specific terminology. So, Sagaya. Mm-hmm. Reckoners. Mm-hmm. Drake Hounds. Huh? Kill Yards. Now, I don't know if Kill Yards are a thing that exists in reality necessarily, but I know Drake Hounds aren't. I know Zagaya isn't a thing that exists in our real world, and I don't know what a Reckoner's Arena is. Now, all of these concepts I happen to know are established elsewhere in League of Legends lore. Like, if you look on the map, you'll find concept art, for instance, of the Drake Hounds. I believe there's some mention of the Reckoner's Arena in some other pieces of lore. So all of this information is technically available to you as the reader, but what happens here instantly is that anyone who's not familiar deeply familiar, like, who, who doesn't have a, a general to a deep understanding of, of the various concepts and the various terminologies at play in League of Legends lore, is gonna go, what the hell is a Sagaya Enclave, and what are Drake Hounds, are, are they dog dragons, I don't know, what's a Reckoner's Arena, what is that, what are the kill yards, like, and you can kind of infer that they sort of probably mean something sort of like that, and you can kind of infer that it probably means something sort of like this, and it's not like it, it alienates you completely, but it's the kind of thing where if you do this a lot, and I do see fantasy writers who do that, like one of the things that fantasy writers will often do um, that I see is they will open their story and they will immediately just start pouring out terminology from inside their unit. Like, oh, these are the, the you know, Reckoner's Arena and the Kelly Arts. They'll pour out all this specific terminology that exists within their universe because they're so eager to share it, that to tell you that there are all these specific things and they all have a history and they all have a special... And for me, at least, as a reader, if I see a whole bunch of that up front, 
I get turned off. Like, I get alienated because I, 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 I don't care about your made-up dictionary, dude. I care about who are the characters, what are the story, what's the story, what's the stakes, why should I care about this world? And it's not enough to just say, tell me, oh, there's a lot of cool stuff in here that's called all these special names. Show rather than tell, right? It's not a bad issue, particularly, in, uh, in this particular short story. In fact, this particular short story does a very good job of managing it, but... It's a thing that happens in other League of Legends lore, and it's something I bring up every single time because it's something that keeps bothering me. <clears throat> the cry- oh, hello. The cries of widowed spouses, grief-stricken mothers, or nightmare-wracked veterans were a nightly chorus to accompany the roars of drunken soldiers, and the promises of street hawkers who plied their trade best in darkness. No, the knights in Noxus were never silent. Except here. This part of Noxus was deathly quiet. Mora held her pack of brushes, paints, and charcoals close to her chest as she felt the din of the Noxian night fade. The lack of sound was so sudden, so shocking, that she stopped in the middle of the street, never normally a good idea, and looked around. The street was in an older, wealthier district of Noxus known as Morto Mortora? Don't know how to pronounce that, or Iron Gate, but was otherwise unremarkable. The light of a full moon reflected from its pavings of regular cobbles like the scores of watching eyes, and the buildings to either side were well built with stone blocks that spoke of an experienced hand, perhaps that of a war mason. Mora saw a tall shrine at the end of the side street where three armored figures knelt before an, the obsidian wolf within its pillowed vault. <clears throat> they looked up in unison, and Mora hurried on, knowing it was unwise to attract the notice of men who prayed in the dark with swords. Here's a lovely little bit. Here's something that I like a lot better. Three armored figures knelt before the obsidian wolf within its pillared vault. The wolf is... The wolf, like kindred, you know, lamb and wolf, the, the kindred, who are... The, the wolf is worshipped much more in Noxus as, as a symbol of death, as a symbol of, indeed, courage to face death and stuff like that. And just having that little thing of... Instead of saying they knelt before the monument to the wolf, that part of the holy duology of the death representations, kindred the wolf and lamb the wolf, and the cowardly Damasians worship the lamb, but the Noxians, oh, they worship the wolf because they... Like, not, not doing a whole bunch of shoving a bunch of, of extraneous world building in there, but just having it there. Because this is the kind of thing where, like, an average reader doesn't see a bunch of specific terminology here. They don't They don't see uh, um, the obsidian Haktuka, the special wolf. Like, there's no special terminology. It's just she sees a shrine, there's a wolf in there. That's all we need to know. And the people who know about the backstory of League of Legends get a little boost, get a little, ah, I see, that is the wolf from the kindred and the wolf and the thing. But average readers are just, oh, okay, it's just, it's just a thing. That's the better way to do it. Like, rather than using in-universe special terminology, just describe the thing well enough that an experienced reader can understand what you mean, and then move on. <clears throat> and that's just something I wanted to bring up, because that's why I took the time to um, talk about it up here, is because here we have a good example of a better way to do that little bit of, of referring back to stuff in the lore without kind of grinding the story to a halt a little bit in order to insert a special piece of terminology in there. <clears throat> she shouldn't be out here in the dark. Tavo had warned her not to go, but she'd seen the serpent in his eyes and knew it wasn't fear for her safety that moved him, but envy. He had always believed himself to be the best painter in their little circle, that she had been selected for this commission instead of him cut deep. When the crisply folded and elegantly written letter had arrived at their shared studio, Cerise and Conrad had been elated, begging her to remember everything she could, while Circa simply told her to be sure her brushes were clean. You think you'll get to speak to him? Cerise had asked as Mora opened the door to, the, to hear the drifting echoes of the night bell fading over the harbor. The idea of winter, venturing out into the darkness filled Mora with equal parts dread and excitement. I'm sitting for a portrait, so I suppose I shall have to, she'd answered, pointing to the darkened sky. We'll need to discuss what manner of painting he wants, especially since I won't have natural light. Strange that he wants his portrait done at night, eh? said Conrad, wide awake and wearing his blanket like a cloak. I wonder what he sounds like, added Cerise. Just like everyone else, Shep Tavo, rolling over and wadding his threadbare pillow. He's not a god, you know, he's just a man. Now, will you all just shut up? I'm trying to sleep. Cerise ran over and kissed her. Good luck, she giggled. Come back and tell us everything, no matter how sordid. Mora's smile had faltered, but she nodded. I will, I promise. The directions to her new patron's mansion were exceptionally specific, not simply in her eventual destination, but in the precise route she must take to get there. 
Mora knew the geography of the capital well, having walked its streets for days when the hunger when hunger gnawed her belly, or when they couldn't pool enough commission money and the owner of their studio kicked them out until they'd earned enough to pay what was owed. This part of town, though, was a growing mystery to her. She'd known the mansion was here, of course. Everyone in Noxus knew where he lived, though few could recall ever going there. With every step she took, Mora felt like she'd wandered into a strange city in a newly conquered land. The streets felt unfamiliar, narrower and more threatening, as if each twist and turn brought the walls closer and closer until they would eventually crush her. She hurried on through the unnerving quiet, craving a source of fresh light, a boundary lantern perhaps, or a low-burning candle in an upper window set to guide a night-calling suitor. So, a couple of things here. We are pretty good distance into this story, and we still don't really know what who our protagonist is. So far, all we've gotten is implication. We know that, she, okay, she's presumably a painter. She's The dude is sitting for a portrait. She's living in a gallery with some other people who are, I guess, also... It's all. It's never really spelled out specifically. That's not a criticism, necessarily. But the thing about this story in particular is... We never actually get to know the protagonist very well at all. She never really gets to be a character in the story. And for me, that feeling begins here that we know that Mora is out walking in the dark, going to, you know, paint a portrait for a dude who's clearly important and kind of intimidating and, and, and very well admired. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big commission, it's an important job, she's out there walking. But what's, like, what's her motivation? Is she, does she, is she there because she wants the money? Like, is that what the implication is? That she wants the money for the commission? Or is it because she wants the glory of painting an important figure or like what's why is she doing this beyond just because he called her right there's no sense of the internal life of the character herself and there's a reason for that because she's not as we shall see as the story goes on she's not really that much of a character she's more of a vessel she's more of a means for us to understand what's happening in the story um she's the character through whom we see Noxus, we see all the stuff that's happening, we see the eventual events that take place as she gets to the house of the mysterious patron who, ooh, I wonder who that could be in Vladimir's color story here, or short story. And this is a narrative choice that you can make. And this is one of the things that's always been the limitation of the short stories that Riot makes, is that, like, it's a short story. You can only do so much, and you only have a really limited amount of space to spend on character building, on world building, on establishing the stakes, on establishing, you know, what the place looks like, who the characters are, where the action is going on. You really have to budget that carefully. And one of the things that seems to have gotten kind of lost in the budget for this one is any substantial characterization of our main character beyond she's a painter and that's it. Like, that's it's kind of all we really know about her is that she's a painter who wants to paint a thing. So... She hurried on through the unnerving quiet, craving a source of fresh light, a boundary lantern, perhaps, or a low-burning candle in an upper window set to guide a night-calling suitor. By the way, this one is really good. Um, this is a really good little bit of, of world-building that, in Noxus, if you have a gentleman or a lady coming over late at night, perhaps for a little bit of romantic, then you put a light in... Uh, in the window to guide them to where you live. Like, that's a lovely little bit of world building. That gives a, that's a nice detail. One of the things that can happen, and certainly something that does happen in the League of Legends universe, is that the, the cities and the towns and stuff tend to be described in rather arch terms, in the terms of like, ah, yes, the citizens of Noxus are good and honorable and they care about their duty and they think we get descri descriptions that are very much based around the, the archetypes and the look and the feel of the region as a whole, but this here, this is such a human thing, because it's about sex, first of all, um, but it's it's such a human little thing. Of course, yeah, if you have someone coming over late at night, you put a little candle out so they know which room to go to to have a lovely, nice evening time together. Like that, That's a human touch that makes the place feel, oh, it feels like people live here. It feels like ordinary people who, you know, eat and drink and fart and have sex with people maybe they shouldn't be having sex with. They, that, that's the kind of little detail that, for me, that's just, mwah, that's a good thing. But there was no elimination beyond that of the moon. Her heartbeat and pace quickened as she heard what could be a soft footfall behind her or the sigh of an expectant breath. Turning a sharp corner, Mora found herself in a circular plaza with a fountain gurgling at its center. 
In a city as cramped as this, where people lived cheek by jowl and space was at a premium, such extravagance was almost unheard of. She circled the fountain's pool, its water silver in the moonlight, admiring the sculpted realism of its carved centerpiece. Hammered from crude iron, it represented a headless warrior encased in a thick warplate and bearing a spiked mace. Water spilled from the neck of the statue, and Mora felt a chill as she realized who it was intended to represent. So, sounds a lot like Mordekaiser. Because, you know, he has no head, and the whole thing about Mordekaiser is that his skull was taken away, and so he couldn't regenerate, and he has a spiked maze and things. So, there's a big wrought iron statue of Mordekaiser outside of Vladimir's house. Interesting. She heard past the fountain towards a double gate of seasoned silver bark, set in a black wall of red-veined marble. As the letter had promised, it stood ajar, and Mora eased herself between its heavy leaves. A double gate of seasoned silver bark. Again, I can imagine what that probably is, but I don't know what that is, so yeah, it doesn't really matter either way. It's just supposed to sound kind of opulent. The mansion within the walls had been built from a pale stone of a kind she hadn't seen before, imposing, without being monolithic, as a great many grand structures of Noxus often were. Nor, the more she studied it, did it adhere to any one particular style, but rather a collection of architectural movements that had come and gone over the centuries. Foremost among such oddities was a rough stone tower rising over the main building, and this portion alone appeared out of place. It gave the impression that the mansion had been built around some ancient shaman's lair. The effect should have been jarring, but Mora rather liked it, as though every aspect of the mansion offered a glimpse into a bygone age of the Empire. Its windows were shuttered and dark, and the only light she saw was a soft crimson glow at the tower's summit. Ooh, ominous. So, here's where we get see what the what the game of the story actually is. It's because one of the reasons why it's we our protagonist isn't really a character, we don't really know anything about her, is because, well, we kind of don't... We aren't supposed to really know anything about her because the story isn't about her. It's about Vladimir. And what's happening here is that in looking through Mora's eyes on all of the stuff that Vladimir has, we get some inklings, some, some implications, and some idea of the kind of person that he is or has been. And if you remember from the What's the Deal with Vladimir story, part of the new story that he's got going on here is that he is an immortal, essentially. Not in the sense that he cannot be killed, but in the sense that he's so good at blood magic that he keeps renewing himself and has essentially lived many different lives over the ages. And once, long, long, long ago, Vladimir was actually an ancient kind of shaman for various barbarian tribes around Noxus, except perhaps behaved more like a god to them. So the, so the implication here is that his house in Noxus was built around the ancient shaman's tower that he lived in back when Noxus was still dominated by Mordekaiser. Probably not the case, but it, it seems to be the thing that's kind of calling back to that part of his life. And that's why the, 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 the house is made of all these different architectural styles from different ages. Ah, it's sort of a tapestry of the many lives that Vladimir has lived. She followed a graveled path through an exquisite garden of elaborate topiary, carefully directed waterways and strange-looking flowers with exotic scents and vi startlingly vivid colors. This, together with the spacious plaza outside, suggested fabulous wealth. The idea that she had been chosen for this task sent a frisson of pleasurable warmth through her limbs. This is the first time, I think, we really get any inkling of Mora's motivation, of what she wants, why she's here. She's feeling pride at the idea of having been chosen for a commission by a fabulously wealthy, really important person. Okay, here we get an inkling of, of the, the idea that she has some kind of personality underneath, but it's never really particularly explored. Let's see. Hundreds of colorful butterflies with curiously patterned wings flitted to and fro between the flowers. Such light and fragile creatures, yet so beautiful and capable of the most miraculous transformation. Mora had never seen butterflies at night, and she laughed with joy as one alighted on her palm. The tapered shape of its body and the patterning on its outstretched wings was uncannily similar to the winged blade heraldry she saw flying on every Noxian flag. The butterfly fluttered its wings and flew away. Mora watched it circle and swoop with the others, amazed to see so many rare and wonderful creatures. She let her fingers brush the colorful leaves as she passed, savoring the scents clinging to her fingertips and drifting up in motes of dust that glittered in the moonlight. She paused by a particularly beautiful bloom, one with flame-red petals so bright they took her breath away. <clears throat> so, um, the butterflies. They come up a little bit. And there's a couple of themes that are going on with them, specifically 
This one is important to Vladimir. The miraculous transformation. As you may remember again from the What's the Deal with Vladimir story, Vladimir doesn't have a mind that's immortal. He can't remember everything that's happened. He still has a very human brain. And so one of the ways that he seems, it seems that one of the ways that he copes with living so long and living so many different lives is, well, he transforms himself. He changes into a different person almost from sort of regenerating himself over and over again. Kind of in the same way that Doctor Who does. Or the Doctor from Doctor Who, if you want to be really pedantic about it. Like that you have this character who has lived many lives, not just in the sense of, oh, he has taken on different identities, but in the sense that he has been many different people over the ages. And um, that's, that's, that's the butterfly metaphor at work there, is that he transforms himself much like a butterfly. But there's also something else going on with them, which we'll get to in a moment. She pa paused by a particularly beautiful bloom, one with flame red petals so bright they took her breath away. No red she had ever mixed from Shiriman cinnabar or Piltoven ochre had achieved such luster. Even the ruinously expensive Ionian vermilions were dull by comparison. She chewed her bottom lip as she considered what she was about to do, then reached out to pluck a number of petals from the nearest plant. The flower's remaining petals immediately curled inwards and bent the, the stem bent away from her as if, as if in fear. <laughs> Mora felt a terrible guilt and looked up at the mansion to see if she had been observed, but the shuttered windows remained closed and lightless. The front door stood open, and she paused at its threshold. The letter had told her to enter, but now that she was here, Mora felt a curious reluctance. Was this some trap? A means to lure her to some unspeakable fate? If so, it seemed needlessly elaborate. The notion felt absurd, and Mora chided herself for letting fear getting in the way of what was likely to be the greatest opportunity of her life. She took a breath, stepped across the threshold, and entered the mansion. There's also something else going on, by the way, we should probably mention. What begins to happen here is that the language takes on, um, it takes on the language of aesthetics and the language of sensibility, of of of, of sensuousness rather. Um, it, we're talking about sort of she's she's transfixed by all these beautiful colors and these wonderful sights, and she's feeling warmth through her limbs, and she's laughing with joy, and she's feeling guilt. Like we're all, all of a sudden we're very much inside of her feelings, inside of how she feels, and so we get a sense of the seduction that's essentially going on here. And the whole sequence, to me, very much reads like something out of, say, um, Phantom of the Opera, or indeed any vampire story, where you have the human victim, the woman, usually, being seduced, being being taken in by this this pleasure of the senses that is following her around, and that's that's that, you know, sort of slowly with, with, withering away her resistance towards whatever may be coming when she finally encounters the creature, the vampire, the phantom, the ghost, whatever it may be. And this is something that's that's really common in uh, romantic fiction. And I don't mean romantic in the sense of romance novels and stuff like that, but romantic as in the period. Uh, romantic literature. Where there was a hell of a lot of focus on like, um, on <clears throat> characters like being very much in their feelings and and you know, experiencing grand emotions and stuff like that. It's a very prominent thing in, for instance, um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, like the original novel. Like That's very much a thing where there's a lot of very powerful personal feelings during that. I think it's also something that's common in gothic literature, but I wouldn't quote me on that because I'm not really an expert. But the point here is that what the writer is doing is because that's the whole romantic literature thing, that's not really present here in the start. This is much more of a of your standard um, sort of modern uh, pop culture writing, uh, YA novel writing, not, not, as, not as a put down, but this very accessible pop writing style that's really, really common in fantasy, which is very accessible, which is very easy to read, which is very sort of uh, pleasant to read as well. And then, as he requires it, he slips into tropes and themes and ideas that are borrowed from a different period in literature. And he doesn't write it quite as f in quite so flowery a, a, a type of language as the actual romantics sometimes did, of course, but He's borrowing some of that, those techniques, some of those ideas to sort of get you into the mind and the feelings of the person in the story. And that's something that I've always really liked about, especially modern fantasy, but also um, the good League of Legends lore, is that the writers there seem conscious and very good at borrowing from past literary traditions in order to, like, using the tropes and using the already established concepts that exist in literature, you kind of get their point across. And that's 
just, it's just a nice thing to see. And it's something that's really valuable to be able to do in your own writing, by the way. Um, cause like it's, it's a really, it's just a really nice shorthand. It's a really convenient way to do these kinds of things. <clears throat> The Vestipuli was vaulted by dark and heavy timbers, with faded murals of the Empire's early bloody days painted in the spaces between. To Mora's left and right, wide openings revealed long galleries draped in shadow, making it difficult to tell who or what might be displayed. A long, curving staircase climbed to an upper mezzanine and a wide archway, but what lay beyond was impossible to make out. <clears throat> the Vestipuli was all but empty, save for what looked like a large sheet-draped sheet -draped canvas upon an easel. Mora tentatively approached the covered canvas, wondering if this was to be where she would paint. She hoped not. The light in here was ill-suited to portraiture, where moonlight pooled on the herringbone floor. Herringbone? That sounds like a thing that exists in real life. The space was bright, but everywhere else it was entirely dark, as though the light refused to approach those corners. Hello? She said, and her voice echoed through the vestibule. I have a letter... Her words lingered, and Mora sought in vain for any sign she wasn't entirely alone in this strange house in the middle of the night. Hello? She said again. Is anyone here? I am here, said a voice. Mora jumped. The words were cultured, masculine, and redolent with age. Why, thank you very much. <laughs> no, that was not a commentary on my delivery. Uh, they seemed to drift down from above and be breathlessly whispered in her ear at the same time. She turned on the spot, searching for the speaker. She was alone. Are you Vladimir? she asked. I am, yes, he replied, his voice freighted with deep melancholy, as if the main name itself were a source of torment. You are the painter. And here again, a lot of talks about feelings and torment and deep emotional connection to a thing, which again is when you're dealing with specific types of characters, especially... Um, the Byronic Hero, uh, which is a term that you should really just kind of Google because that's a lot easier than me trying to explain it to you, but essentially the, a, a type, an, an archetype of hero that is modeled after both the real-life personage and the writings of Lord Byron, which is a very specific type of, of archetypal hero, which tends to be a hero that has an emotionally compromised state that, you know, messes with him and, and it forms one of the bases of all of his troubles and so on and so forth. That kind of seemed to be the, the thing that they're going for here, is that that um, if you think of Phantom of the Opera, by the way, he's a really good example of a Byronic hero. Byronic antagonist, perhaps more so, depending on which version of the character you're looking at. But yeah, um, the same thing with um, Victor Frankenstein, of course, tends to, to fall into that category as well, as far as I'm aware. <clears throat> yes, that's me. I, I, I'm the painter, she said, adding, my name is Maura Bentsia. B Betsinia, I'm the painter. She cursed her clumsiness before realizing his last words had not been a question. Good. I have been waiting a long time for you. Oh, oh. My apologies, sir. The letter said I wasn't to leave until the harbor bell rang. Indeed it did. And you have arrived precisely when you were supposed to, said Vladimir. And this time Mora thought she saw a sliver of deeper black in the shadows. It is I who am at fault for... I have been delaying sending for someone like you much too long. Vanity makes fools of us all, does it not? Is it vanity? Asked Mora, knowing the wealthier patrons like to be flattered, or simply waiting for the right moment to capture the truth of your appearance. Laughter drifted down from above. Mora couldn't decide if he thought she'd said something funny or if he was mocking her. I hear a variation of that every time, said Vladimir. And as to truth, <laughs> that is a movable feast. Tell me. Did you like my garden? Mora sensed a trap in the question and hesitated before answering. I did, she said. I had no idea you could grow anything that beautiful in Noxian soil. You cannot, said Vladimir with wry amusement. Such thin soil produces only the hardiest specimens, ones that spread far and wide to drive out all others. But none of them could be called beautiful. The red flower you killed, it was a night bloom. Mora felt her mouth go dry, but Vladimir appeared not to care what she had done. Night blooms were once native to an island chain in the east. A blessed place of rare beauty and enlightenment, he said. I dwelled there for a time until it was destroyed, as all mortal endeavors must ultimately be. I took some seeds from a grove once tended by a temperamental nature spirit and brought them back to Valoran, where I was able to entice them to grow with a combination of blood and tears. So, a couple of things here. 
an island chain to the east, a blessed place of rare beauty and enlightenment. That is the Blessed Isles, currently known as the Shadow Isles, because, you know, bad stuff happened there. The ruined king screwed all of it up. I took some seeds from a grove once tended by a temperamental nature spirit. That sounds to me a lot like Maokai. So there's a lot of little... And again, if you remember what we were talking about before, referencing back to the canon to, to the, the sort of the fantasy universe details of the story, it's much better done in little things where it's like, where you don't need to understand that this is probably Maokai in order to understand the sentence, in order to, to appreciate what the sentence is trying to do for the story, which is to, you know, pump up Vladimir's achievements and his ancientness and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, don't you mean blood, sweat, and tears? My dear, what possible use would sweat be in growing a flower? Mora had no answer, but the musical cadence of his voice was seductive. She could listen to it all night. Mora shook off the velvet quality of Vladimir's drifting voice and nodded towards the covered canvas. Is that where I'm to paint? she asked. Oh, said Vladimir. That was merely my first. Your first what? My first life, he said, as she lifted the edge of the sheet. The painting had faded with the passage of time, its colors bleached by light, and the brush strokes flattened, but the image was still powerful. A young man on the cusp of adulthood, armored an archaic-looking bronze plate and bearing a fluttering banner depicting a wickedly curved scythe blade. Much of the detail had been lost, but the boy's blue eyes were still piercingly bright. The face was extraordinarily handsome, symmetrical, and with a tilt of the head that captivated her gaze. Mora leaned in and saw an army behind the young man, a host of hulking warriors too large to be human, too bestial to be real. Their outlines and features had faded with age, and Mora was thankful for that small mercy. This is you, she asked, hoping he might appear and explain the portrait in person. Once a long, long time ago, said Vladimir, and Mora felt ice enter his words, I was an unneeded heir of a long-banished kingdom. In an age when gods made war on one another, mortals were pawns in their world-spanning strife, and when the time came for my father to bend the knee to a living god, I was giving up as a royal hostage. In theory, my father's loyalty would be assured by the constant threat to my life. Should he break faith with his new master, I would be slain. Like all my father's promises, it was empty. He cared nothing for me, and broke his oath within the year. The story Vladimir was telling was strange and fantastical, like the Shuriman myths Conrad told when they shared scare stories on the roof of the studio at night. Conrad's tales were thinly veiled morality plays, but this... This had the weight of th truth behind it, and felt uncontaminated by sentimentality. Does it, though? It feels really contaminated by sentimentality to me, actually. But never mind. But instead of killing me, my new master had something altogether more amusing in mind. Amusing for him, at any rate, he offered me the chance to lead his armies against my father's kingdom. An offer I gladly accepted. I destroyed my father's city and presented his head to my master. I was a good and faithful hound on a leash. You destroyed your own people. Why? Vladimir paused as though trying to decide if her question was serious. As even the god warriors, even if the god warriors had not come, my father's kingdom would never have been mine, he said. Yet sons and heirs are plenty, and I would never have lived long enough to claim my birthright. Why would your master make you do that? I used to think it was because he saw a spark of greatness within me, or the potential to be something more than a mere mortal, said Vladimir, with a soft sigh that sent shivers down Mora's spine, again with a seduction. Uh, but more likely he just thought it would be amusing to teach one of his mortal pets some tricks, as the mountebank teaches a monkey to dance around his stall to attract the gullible. Mora looked back at the image of the young man in the picture, now seeing something dark lurking deeper in the eyes. A hint of cruelty, perhaps. A glint of festering bitterness. <clears throat> so, this is the exposition part of the story. And oh boy, is it a lot of exposition. And the trouble I have with this particular section is... We already know all of this. Like, we already pretty much know all of this because all of that has been told to us in, in Vladimir's new bio. Uh, not not built out quite so extensively, not with so many details, but still, all of this is known information. And since this story is already kind of assuming that you are relatively v well versed in League of Legends lore, and it assumes that you're interested in League of Legends lore, otherwise why would you seek it out? Well, it's 
it feels a little redundant to go over the same stuff again. Like, it feels like this is a the bio version 2 with tons more detail and, you know, patch notes just saying added 10 million more details to the early part of Vladimir's life. And it's sort of... <laughs> I feel like you could cut this down a lot. I feel like you could really kind of cut out a lot of detail and sort of have Vladimir just imply things to Mora instead. And maybe talk about the specifics of like his father and how he killed him and how it was like part of his first life is that that aspect of it. But really kind of pare back on it <clears throat> and the story wouldn't really lose anything in particular. It's really expository. And again, this is where Mora as a character becomes a bit of a problem because she doesn't she can't push back on it. Like, she doesn't She doesn't really have an opinion or some kind of perspective to add to what's going on here. She just asks questions in order to get Vladimir to keep talking. <clears throat> and it's like, to me, it's, it's kind of a boring way to write this kind of stuff. Uh, like, it, what I would have done instead, like, maybe have a series of paintings that kind of tell the story almost like a comic book showing various phases of Vladimir's life as a leader of the um, Darken armies and so on and so forth. Like the, there, are, there are ways to do it show more than tell, and this is really a whole lot of tell. As a characterization point for Vladimir, it makes a little bit, it makes a certain degree of sense that Vladimir loves to talk about himself, that he loves to go on about how his life has been and all the stuff he's done and all the things he's seen and yada, yada, yada. But it's, eh. Like, I feel like this could use a lot, another couple of passes in the editing. What did he teach you? Asked Mora. As much as she wasn't sure she wanted an answer, something in her needed to know. And again, why do, like, We don't know who she is as a character. Is she apparently an incredibly curious person who absolutely must know stuff like that? Who has a fascination with grisly details or something? No, because that's not been established anywhere in the story, so why is it that all of a sudden she needs to know? And you can kind of infer, perhaps, that, oh, it's because Vladimir is mind-controlling her. He's making her ask more questions. He's making her keep, you know, pulling answers out of him because he's self-indulgent and narcissistic and he likes to talk about himself. That would be an interesting thing to go for, but then it needs to be somewhat more explicit that Vladimir is influencing her to be a sounding board for him, to just listen to him and to flatter him. Just like, eh, eh, not really sure if, if it, it doesn't really work for me. My master's kind had the power to defy death, to sculpt flesh, blood, and bone to the most wondrous forms, continued Vladimir. He taught me something of their arts, magic he wielded as easily as breathing. But it took every scrap of my intellect and will to master even the simplest of cantrips. I was later to learn that teaching their secrets to mortals was forbidden under pain of death, but my master delighted in flaunting the mores of his kind. Vladimir's sourceless laughter echoed around her, yet there was no mirth in the sound. He couldn't help challenging convention, and in the end, it was his undoing. He died? She asked, and again, she's just asking questions, endlessly. Yes. When one of his kind betrayed them, their power over this world was broken. My master's enemies united against him, and he looked to me to lead his armies in his defense. Instead, I killed him, and drank in a measure of his power, for I had not forgotten the many cruelties he had inflicted upon me over the years. Taking his life was my first step on a road far longer than I could ever have imagined. A boon and a curse in one bloody gift. So there's a reference here. Um, if you remember, I can't remember, if, like, it was a Shuriman lore update. It was a massive short story specifically about um, the ascended warriors of Shurima and how they were eventually destroyed. And that was one of their kind betrayed um, the ascended warriors of Shurima with the help of the aspect of Twilight, who, was not, who wasn't at that time Zoe, but, you know, who was another vessel for the aspect of Twilight, who wasn't Zoe, but that power eventually passed to her. Mora hurt the relish in Vladimir's tone, but also sadness, as if the mark of his murder had cut his cut on his this murder had cut on the, his soul, as if the mark this murder had cut on his soul had never truly left him. There we go. All of a sudden, I couldn't read the sentence. Did he feel guilt at this killing, or was he simply trying to manipulate her emotions? See here. Is he trying to manipulate her emotions? That's a really interesting way to go. Wouldn't that be funny if maybe you spend a little bit more time? talking about that part of it instead of just talking about <sighs> exposition. Anyway. 
Not being able to see him made it that much harder to divine his intent. But enough of this painting, said Vladimir. It is vital, yes, but only one of my many accumulated lives. If you are to immortalize this one, you must see the others I have experienced over the years before we can truly begin. Mora turned to the stairs, as the shadows draping their length retreated like a soft black tide. She licked her lips, conscious again that she was alone in this echoing mansion with Vladimir, a man who had just admitted to murdering his father and his monstrous mentor. Hesitation, really, he said. You've come this far, and I have already bared so much of my soul to you. Mora knew he was goading her into climbing the stairs. That alone ought to make her leave and return to her friends, but as much as she knew she should be afraid, part of her was thrilled to be the center of Vladimir's attention, to feel the power of his gaze upon her. Come to me, he continued. See what it is I ask of you. And then, if you feel the task is too great and choose to leave, I will not stop you. No, she said. I want to know it all. Here, again, we get a little bit of an, impl um, of an indication of why Mora is sticking around with the creepy dude in the empty mansion who has murdered multiple people. But it's like, this would be so much stronger. This would work so much better if we had previously in the story established some aspect of her personality where you go, oh, yeah, she is the kind of person who would get a thrill out of that kind of thing, who would seek out that transgressive relationship, who would seek out that kind of forbidden knowledge kind of thing. But because there isn't, it's just, it's just kind of weak. She she becomes a weak character without a lot of agency. Like, Mora, by the way, doesn't really make much of a decision at any point in the story, which is one of the things that, for me, is always damning of a protagonist, is if they don't make any decisions. She's called to the mansion, so she goes. She enters it, and then she's, you know, progressively more seduced by it. And every time she has the opportunity to make a decision contrary to what Vladimir wants, she doesn't. She goes with what she's obviously being pulled towards doing. And again, it's a short story. You don't have a lot of time to do a lot of world building and character building outside of just the main plot of the short story. But still, it's like, ugh. Weak protagonists annoy me because the protagonist really, the protagonist at least needs to be non-offensive. Like, they need to not annoy the reader. Because once they annoy the reader, it becomes hard to empathize with them. And once you can't empathize with them, you fall out of wanting to take their perspective on things. And then the story just becomes annoying and alienating, at least my experience. So, the archway atop the mezzanine led into a wide corridor of stone, that dark stone that was so shockingly cold it took Mora's breath away. Fixed to the dark walls were row upon row of lacquered wooden boards. And pinned to these boards were many thousands of butterflies with spread wings. Sadness touched Mora. Is this one of my collections? said Vladimir, his voice coming from nowhere and everywhere at once. It drew her onward towards the corridor. Along the corridor. Why did you kill them? To study them? Why else? These creatures live such short lives. To end them a moment sooner is no great loss. The butterfly might disagree, but look at what each death taught me. What do you mean? The butterflies you saw in the garden? They exist nowhere else in nature. They are unique because I made them so. With will and knowledge, I have wrought entire species into being. How is that possible? Because, like the gods, I choose which ones live and which ones die. So, Lepidoptery. <clears throat> Told you the butterflies were going to come up again. The butterflies are people. I, that's not, it's not mince words about it. The butterflies are people, and they are a metaphor for how Vladimir views human beings. Oh, they live such short lives, and I live such a long life, so it doesn't really matter if I kill them. Who cares? Like, ugh, doesn't make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things, right? <clears throat> and just to really hammer the point home and just remove all subtlety from it, because, like the gods, I choose which ones live and which ones die. So he's like, literally, oh, I kill butterflies and people because I am a god. That's very much, the, like, not even the subtext, just the text of what's happening here is that Vladimir is talking about how he considers himself fundamentally apart from and above other living creatures, especially also humans. <clears throat> he kills humans for fun, or because it teaches him something, or because it is useful for him that they die. Overwatch music, hmm, might not be appropriate to what we're doing right now. There. Let's get that out of the playlist. 
Alrighty then. Mora reached out to the nearest pinned butterfly, one with vivid crimson circles on the larger part of its wings. As soon as her, soon as her finger brushed the insect's body, its wings disintegrated, and the rest of it crumbled like ancient flaking paint. A cold wind sighed past Mora, and she stepped in ba back in alarm as a cascade of dissolution swept across the pinned specimens. Scores, then hundreds of butterflies, crumbled to powder that spun in the air like ash and cinders stirred from a blanked f banked fire. Oi, good lord. She cried out and rushed down the corridor, frantically waving her hand to brush the dust from her face. It grazed the skin beneath her clothes, then she spat as she tasted the grit of insect bodies in her mouth, felt it gather in her ears. She stopped and opened her eyes as she felt the quality of sound and light change. She rubbed dust from her face, seeing she had entered into a wide, circular chamber. And again, Vladimir just wiped out, like, hundreds of butterflies just to mess with another person, basically. Again, if the butterflies are people, what does that tell us about how he uses his power, how he approaches, you know, his magic and his position in society? <laughs> Mora took a moment to look around and regain her composure, brushing the layers of dust, the last of the dust from her face and clothes. The walls of the chamber were primitively cut stone, and she guessed she stood within the base of an ancient tower, the ancient tower. A rough-hewn staircase corkscrewed its way up the interior walls, and strange ruby light fell in, fell in shimmering veils from somewhere high above. The air smelled of hot metal, like the iron winds carried from the bulk forges that fed the Empire's insatiable hunger for armor and weapons. The circular walls were hung with portraits, and she moved cautiously along the gallery's circumference, studying each painting in turn. No two were alike in their framing or style, ranging from crude abstracts to rendering so lifelike it was as if a real face was imprisoned within the warp and weft of the canvas. She recognized the styles of some, the work of masters of the craft who had lived centuries ago. With the paintings in the vestibule were that of a young man in his prime, these were a mixture of the same individual, but at very different times in his life. <clears throat> One showed him in his middle years, still fit and hearty, but with a bitter cast to his eyes. Another was a portrait of a man so aged and ravaged that Mora wasn't even sure it had been painted while the subject was still alive. Yet another depicted him bloodily wounded in the aftermath of a great battle before a titanic statue of ivory stone. A titanic statue of ivory stone? Hmm... Do we know any titanic statues of ivory stone in the League of Legends? It's Galio. He fought Galio and got his ass handed to him, basically. How can these all be you? She asked. The answer drifted down in the veils of red light. I do not live as you do. The gift carried in my former master's blood changed me forever. I thought you understood that. I do. I, I mean, I think I do. The paintings around you are moments of my many lives. Not all great moments, I've come to realize. And captured by journeymen, for the most part. In the earliest days of my existence, I was arrogant enough to believe that my every deed was worthy of such a commemoration, but... Now... But now? asked Mora, when he didn't continue. Now I only commit the renewal of my life to canvas, amid events that mark turning points in the affairs of the world. Climb the steps and see what I mean. Mora found her circuit of the gallery had brought her to the base of the stairs, as though every her every step had been lit... Her every step had led her to this point. Not just tonight, but every moment she, since she had first picked up the brush and painted the animals on her mother's farm in Krexor. Why me? She asked. Why am I here? There are other artists in Noxus better than me. A soft chuckle drifted, drifted around her. Such modesty. Yes, it's true. There are artists more technically proficient than you, said Vladimir. Your jealous colleague Tao, for instance, understands perspective better than you ever will. Young Cerise's use of color is outstanding, and the stoic Circa has an eye for detail that makes his work endlessly fascinating. Conrad, however, will never be more than a dabbler, but you already know this. You know my friends, she said. Of course. You think I chose you at random? I don't know. How did you choose me? And again, she's only ever asking questions. To capture such a transformative moment, I required someone whose heart and soul goes into their work. An artist truly worthy of the name. That is why you are here, Mora Bensenia. Because every brush stroke is personal to you. Every mark on the canvas, every choice of color has meaning. You understand the heart of a painting and willingly give something of your soul to capture the life it represents. So, ominous foreshadowing. 
she puts her heart and soul into her work, and she's willingly giving some of her soul to capture the life it represents. Hmm. Gee, I wonder if a dude who has survived for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years by consuming the blood and flesh and souls of other people might be foreshadowing something here. Hmm. <laughs> It's not super subtle, but it makes like it works for for the situation where he's seducing her while simultaneously telling her that she's probably not coming out of this one alive. Mora had heard the flattery of patrons and the empty praise of her fellow painters before, but Vladimir's words were utterly sincere. He meant every word, and her heart lifted to hear such affirmation. And again, if the subtext here is that Mora is actually being subtly mind-controlled by Vladimir, and we know from his bio, by the way, that he can control people's minds with blood magic. That's a thing he can do. It would be nice if it was just a little bit more explicit, like that some part of her was going, hey, hang on, something's not right here. We are being too gullible. We are taking his word, taking him at his word too easily. And that that part of, like, that she, there's some kind of struggle inside her where she's kind of pushing back against the control, but losing... Like, because if there's a struggle and she loses, that's a lot more interesting than just, oh, well, she gets mind-controlled, and then that's that. Why now? What's so special about this moment in time that you want your portrait painted? What was it you said? You only have a painting done at a turning point in the affairs of the world. Vladimir's voice seemed to coil around her as he spoke. And such a moment is upon us. I've dwelled here for such a long time, Mora long enough to oust the Iron Revenant from his immortal bastion, long enough to see the many rulers who came after him claw their way to power over the corpses of their brothers before treacherous ambition brought them low, long enough to know the canker that lurks at the Empire's heart, a midnight flower with roots in old and corrupted soil. We have danced, she and I, oh, oh we have danced in blood over the centuries. But the tempo of the music has changed the dance nears its end. This parade of fools I walk among this life is unsuited for what must come next. I don't understand. What is coming next? At almost any other time before, I could have answered that with certainty, continued Vladimir. But now, I do not know. All I know is that I must change to face it. I've been passive for too long and allowed flunkies and hangers-on to fawn over my every whim. But now I am ready to take what is mine, that which was for so long denied me, a kingdom of my own. This is immortality, Mora, mine and yours. Immortality, of course. Is it not by the warrior's deeds and the artist's craft that they achieve immortality? The legacy of their work lives on beyond the feeble span of mortal lives. Demacia reveres the warriors who founded it in the martial tenets to which they dogmatically adhere. Cleave, rather. Great works of literature set down thousands of years ago might still be performed, and sculptures freed from blocks of marble in the ages before the Rune Wars are still viewed by awe, with awe by those who can find them. Mora sensed with complete clarity that to climb these stairs would be committing to something irrevocable, something final. How many other artists had stood where she was right now? How many had lifted their foot and placed it on the first step? How many had come back down? How many had turned and walked away? And again, the seduction of, oh, your work will be immortalized, people will talk about the thing that you did for thousands of years. The idea of that being particularly seductive to her would be so much stronger if that had been established previously in the story, that, that we had understood that this is a powerful part of what motivates her as a human being is to create something meaningful that will last throughout the ages. And because it's not established, it doesn't really land as well. Mora could leave now. Of that she was certain. Vladimir was not lying to her. If she chose to leave, she had no doubt she would arrive back at the studio unharmed. But how could she face each day from now until the wolf and lamb came for her, knowing she had lacked the courage to take this one chance to create something incredible. And again, it would be so much stronger if it was pre-established. Mora, said Vladimir, and this time his single silken voice was right before her. She looked up, and there he was. Silhouetted against the red light drifting down from above, his form slender and cursive. White hair streamed behind him, and swarms of crimson-winged butterflies filled the air above. His eyes, once rendered in vivid blue, were now a smoldering red. They pulsed in time with her heartbeat. And here we finally get 
some kind of implication, some kind of indication that Vladimir is actively manipulating her with blood magic. His eyes are red, they are beating in time with her heartbeat. And again, on the one hand, I feel like, again, Mora as a character would be so much stronger if the story was about her attempting to fight against the seduction, attempting to resist it, which she never does over the course of the story, and failing because Vladimir is just too powerful, or if it had been a genuine seduction. Like, not, not a mind control trick, not, not a blood magic thing, but Vladimir genuinely managing to seduce her just by sheer force of personality. That would also be interesting, which again requires that there's some pushback from the from <clears throat> from the subject. Neither of that is in there, and the character interaction is weakened by it. He reached out to her, and his slender fingers were elegantly tapered with long nails like glittering talons. So, will immortality be our legacy? Asked Vladimir. Yes, she said. It shall. Mora took his hand, and together they climbed the staircase into the veils of crimson. So. Overall, I've got a bunch of nitpicks because I always, always do. But this is quite a well-written story. This is this is really quite good. This is a very interesting Vladimir. As I you know touched on multiple times in my What's the Deal video, the character of Vladimir that's portrayed here, that's shown here, has a hell of a lot of potential for storytelling. You can do a lot with a character who has so many memories and so much life behind them, you know, to draw from in terms of how they behave and how they act. And I think it's also really, really interesting that one of the things that's being set up here is that Vladimir is very tired of the Black Rose. He's tired of them, and he wants to be free of them, and he wants to have a kingdom of his own. Whether that is Noxus, it might be, which will bring him into conflict with the LeBlanc, Swain, and Darius, among many others, I imagine. Or whether that is something else, like he wants to form his own kingdom somewhere. That's not really made clear, but I really like that... It, it says this guy is about to do something. This guy is about to take action. He's about to make... And that's the thing that's sometimes a problem in a lot of, of um, League of Legends lore is that the characters are described in kind of static terms. Like, this is who they are. This is what they want. This is what they're doing. And there isn't a lot of change to them here. Like, a lot of... A lot about this story feels like it should be accompanying a visual update. Because, like, the literal, like the thing he's about to do is he seduces uh, Mora, she paints a portrait of him, and presumably he consumes her blood and uses her life to renew his own. Like, that seems to be the implication of what's going on here. And that would be, like, a perfect opportunity to do a visual update to the character, maybe, including, like, a proper new character design without that stupid, stupid hair. But that doesn't seem to be in the cards, unfortunately. <laughs> and that's, again, sort of like, mm, missed opportunity a little bit there. Like, you have a guy whose story is literally about renewing himself to become a new person. So, eh. But, you know, that's outside of the scope of the story. There's not really a problem with the story. This is a problem with uh, <laughs> Riot Games in general. Seriously, though, Vladimir, it's a visual update. So this is generally a very good story. It manages to do a couple of things very efficiently. First of all, it manages to deepen the history of Noxus a little bit. Like, it, it tells us a little bit more about how Noxus's power structure has been for the past, you know, probably a thousand years or so. That is not just LeBlanc manipulating stuff and then some, you know, not Black Rose rulers being manipulated by her, that there are multiple powers kind of at work here and that Vladimir is part of the, of the Black Rose but not necessarily quite as dedicated to it, perhaps, as characters like Elise or LeBlanc are. So yeah, I mean, I like the story. I think I think I managed to cover my nitpicks pretty decently. It's really well written. Like, I, I know I have my nitpicks about, like, word choices and stuff like that, but this was easy to read through. Like, this is easy to follow through. Like, there's nothing there that kind of stops me and annoys me very much and makes me go, ah, ugh, god damn it. Or makes me go, hmm, you should really try to write that differently or something like that. It's all very well put together. It's all very well written. And most of my problems are structural ones or like problems with the wider context in League of Legends where it's like, this is like the issue that's always going to come up at the end of these videos and which I will never, ever, ever stop talking about until Riot managed to prove me wrong is that for all of the good stuff that's being set up here, for all of the interesting characterization, for all of the, if, you know, the implications about the history of Noxus and what Vladimir is going to do next, none of it matters at all unless they follow up on it. And that's the thing, like, that's the thing historically Riot has been so bad at, and 
which is why I'm not giving them any credit. Like I, I actually got called out by <laughs> by one of the editors of uh, of League of Legends that like that Riot has brought in a bunch of new people, and maybe it's not quite fair to be like, oh, Riot, pff, they suck at doing lore story and they never follow up on anything. Like because there's mostly a whole bunch of new people at Riot who are trying um, to fix some of the mistakes of the past, and I think that's true. That it's not quite fair to saddle them with that, but. It's one of the biggest video games in the world, produced by one of the richest pu publishers of video games in the world, and people have done a lot more with a lot less, and they've had almost 10 years to get this right, so... You know, until further notice, <laughs> until Riot starts to really have a serious output of stories and lore and materials, and uh, like really start building out their IP, which might be what they're doing with that new game they're working on, who knows? I'm gonna keep bringing it up. I'm gonna keep poking them about it because, like, they have like nine years of not being good at getting this stuff right. I'm happy that they're finally making an effort. Like, it finally seems like they're taking control over their lore and control over their stories and making an effort to build on it. But I had to wait for nine years, though. Like, ah, it's a long time, and I'm bitter. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like button down below. Blah, 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 blah. Like bell icon if you want to. <laughs> I'm not sure it matters so much anymore, but I, I appreciate all of the numbers when people click on the things and give me good numbers. That's nice. And it helps my, you know, fragile artistic ego, everything else. I also have a Patreon. If you want to support it with like a dollar a month, then yeah, go on over to Patreon and support me with like a dollar a month or more if you want to and if you can. And by the way... Sometimes I bring this up, and I'm going to bring it up again today. Sometimes I get messages from people who are kind of feeling bad that they can't support on Patreon. Like, oh, I really want to support on Patreon. I like the stuff that uh, feel bad for not... Mm, please don't. Don't have to feel... Like, it's, volunt it's for people who have a little bit of extra money that you're not going to miss. If you are not in a position to support someone on Patreon, I promise you, neither me nor anyone else who uses Patreon or who does creative work is like, uh, hmm, how dare they not... No, we're... Take care of yourself first. That's the important thing, okay? So, if you, if you can't support on Patreon, don't worry about it. Please, for the love of God. What's left? Right, dislike button. Yes, the, if you don't, if you stand up there, and you don't, then the dislike button. There's a, there's a dislike button if you don't like the, the, the video. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what the dislike button is for. So, oh, good lord, this was a long video. I know I usually make up a dislike button story, but I'm really genuinely quite exhausted right now. So, like, click the, don't click the dislike button or else it sucks your blood, I guess. It's the dislike button story for today. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for watching.